I can't have a code. So welcome everybody to our optimization also seminar. Today, we're very happy to have uh, Professor Matthias Staudigl from uh, Maastricht University. He's going to talk about conditional gradient methods uh, and some new uh, insights and applications in machine learning. So uh, we're very happy to have him here today. So Matthias, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Uh, thanks a lot for, for having me, for inviting me to the seminar series. I apologize at the forefront that I couldn't make it. In principle, I was planning to travel to Oslo, but um, yeah, I was involved in a lot of travel in the last week. So um, uh, I decided to do this now online, to do something good to the environment, but also to myself. Um, so uh, this is uh, a talk about some recent work that I did together with my dear friends and co-authors, Pavel Durekensky from the Weierstrass Institute and Shimrit Stern from the Technion in Israel. And it's about conditional gradient methods for specific classes of optimization problems that have received a lot of attention in various communities, but mostly in data science and machine learning in the recent years. So uh, the talk is um, organized in two parts, essentially. So I'm, present I'm trying to present here somehow the coherent message behind two papers, one being published already and one something like work in progress and almost finished to illustrate to you what conditional gradient methods, first of all, are, what they can do for you, and why they might be interesting for various problems that you have faced, maybe. So let me start maybe first with a generic kind of motivation about the type of optimization problems that we might want to solve. So the first type of problem I would like to solve in my talk would be classical empirical risk minimization problems that are essentially the bread and butter of online machine learning problems. So here you have a task to solve by finding a parameter vector X. This could, could be a set of parameters in a kind of a classification or regression problem or whatever statistical uh, estimation problem you have to solve, but it could be also uh, different types of problem like training the weights in a neural network and so on and so forth. And what you typically have in these type of applications is that you have a sample of size M. And for each sample, you receive kind of information how much um, distortion you have essentially given the set of weights or parameters that you're currently using in your technology. So this LIX is kind of a data fidelity function or statistical loss function that essentially gives you some information on how good you are doing your job in uh, recovering the original signal, whatever it is. On top, what you usually have there is some kind of regularization that's either literally acting like a regularization in your optimization problem, or it is added because, you know, with the quadratic term, you do kind of a uh, um, smoothing and convexification of your problem to make maybe the sub iterations of some numerical procedure that you want to use more efficiently. Okay. What is the typical problem, however, in all these problems? So the characteristic features of any type of risk minimization problem is this finite sum structure, right? That you are training here a model with M loss functions. And also what a characteristic feature is that the parameter vector X itself might lie in a very high dimensional space E, which is going to be for the rest of my talk, always some finite dimensional Euclidean vector space. Okay. Everything I will talk in the here in this uh, seminar is finite dimensional. You can of course think of this as a suitable discretization of an infinite dimensional problem when you're interested in dynamics or something like that, or PDEs. Um, I will not dwell into this. For me, the problem that I have to solve is always going to be somehow embedded in a finite dimensional space. Okay, so no infinite dimensional problems will arise in my talk here. But still, of course, the dimensionality of the feature vector that you would like to train it could be very high, and usually it is very high. So you have big data. Let's use this buzzword. Of course, it's very outdated, of course, already. You have big data in the sense that both problem dimensions uh, can be huge, right? And that usually from an optimization perspective is the interesting challenge that we need to tackle. Sim simply that they have a large scale uh, kind of optimization problem. What type of method can you actually think about uh, using to train or, mini or to solve the minimization problem you have here? Right, because of the... Uh, 
Classical and theory point methods in principle can be used to any kind of convex optimization problem once you put it in the conic reformulation. Uh, it's only essentially the large scales of the optimization problem that usually makes the application of interior point methods at least not straightforward and sometimes indeed um, just not admissible. It's not just not going to be feasible anymore. And that essentially over the last 20 years uh, led to a huge uh, explosion of scientific research uh, using gradient based or first order methods that are somehow simple technologies or methodologies that use only information conveyed by the gradient of your objective function in order to find iteratively a solution or an approximate solution, of course, of your underlying optimization problem. Now, of course, for gradient methods to have some guarantees, some rigorous guarantees, we need some assumptions. So usually what we have here is, of course, convexity. That's something we usually assume. So usually what we assume is that the loss functions Li are convex and they have Lipschitz continuous gradients. So Lipschitz continuity and convexity together are usually the assumptions that are made in order to guarantee convergence and also some good iteration complexity guarantees of first order methods. The typical outcome that you have there, of course, after you trained your model after usually a very long amount of time, what you have here uh, are guarantees that are embodied usually by a kind of a var variance bias type of trade off for these empirical risk minimization problems. So suppose X star is the candidate solution that you obtained from your first order method. And let's call X zero the ground truth of your model that, of course, we don't know but maybe there's some oracle that tells you what the ground truth would be. In general, what you can prove if you have a Lipschitz continuous gradient and convex uh, loss function, the bias, so to speak, the difference between the training outcome and the ground truth scales according to two quantities that look like this. So first is going to be kind of the variance of the problem that depends on this Lipschitz modulus of the gradient, the problem dimension, and the convexity parameter mu. And the second part here is just a bias term that essentially says how big, how big your scale is your original parameter. Now, what can you do here to mitigate this variance bias trade-off? There's only one free variable essentially that you have. That's the mu the regularization parameter that acts like the strong convexity parameter in your optimization problem. So if you would like to balance these things, then of course, what you should do is you should choose the mu like the reciprocal of the square root of the number of samples of M that's just obtained by minimizing this quantity here with respect to mu. Well, as we said, M is usually big. You have a lot of data points to train. Mu is usually something that you choose not too big. You don't want too many distortions in your problem. And the Lipschitz gradient usually numerically is large. So this ratio here, okay, can be quite big. So that means essentially your accuracy, your results that you obtain might be quite poor. And whenever this is the case, that the ratio L over mu or L squared over mu, the so-called condition number of the problem, uh, if this is a, uh, something like a huge quantity, then we call such problems ill conditions. And the question what is what happens when you essentially face ill condition problems? Can you somehow come up uh, with methods that are able to adapt to this ill conditioning phenomenon in a, in a scalable way? And without further assumptions of the problem, the general answer that I just gave you suggests no, right? There's nothing more we can do. We have our loss function. We have all the information that we have about this loss function already incorporated. So what can you do? Well, you have to add some information. And the, usually what, is, uh, what has recently been worked out in a bunch of apl uh, applications and concrete problems in machine learning is that most of these statistical loss functions that we actually have in practice are not just simple convex loss functions, but they have some more structure. 
And this more structure is usually encoded in terms of a generalized self-concordant property that I'm going to illustrate to you later. Now, this additional structure about self-concordance uh, introduces interesting uh, new insights, but also challenges. Because most of the time, these self-concordant functions actually do not have a Lipschitz continuous gradient. So there is something to worry about. Usually, this actually makes the problem more challenging for first-order methods. But at the same time, they give you some curvature guarantees that are easy to capture in the algorithms. So there is some potential for improved algorithmic design. And uh, so the first part of the talk is essentially illustrating a, a, a set of tools that we developed for cheap gradient-based methods to exploit this generalized self-concordance uh, uh, properties of the objective functions, of the loss functions, in order to get provably convergent algorithms with good complexity guarantees. In the second talk, or second part of the talk, sorry, um, I'm, I'm, we are using essentially a similar kind of structure. So again, self-concordant type of functions are going to be extremely important for our analysis, but the application focus is more on classical scientific computing type of problems. In particular, we were motivated here by conic optimization problems uh, like optimization problems of a second or over a second order cone or uh, STPs, uh, semi-definite programming. So these are also in practice large scale problems that have a lot of uh, applications, in particular in relaxations for combinatorial optimization problems. And up to now, um, solving large scale STPs is something that is still quite of a challenge uh, in practice. So here is a kind of a, a suggestion we were making to the community to think about how to solve STPs from, a, again, kind of self-concordant perspective and using these conditional gradient uh, type of algorithms. So the, the problem we are looking here is again, a convex optimization problem that not necessarily has a finite sum structure, so it could be any function g. In principle, the function g we would like to minimize here could be even non-smooth. The only thing I assume essentially it's a lower semi-continuous function and it's proper, okay? So that there are some interesting points actually over which we would like to minimize. And here the challenge is essentially the constraints that we have. And again, these constraints are usually coming from some encoding of a relaxation of some combinatorial optimization problem. So what we have there usually are two membership type of constraints where we would like our solution to live in a certain space, X. You can think of this like a positive semi-definite cone or something like that. And we have affine constraints that somehow say, well, you have additional linear restrictions on the solution, okay? So in principle, you optimize here over the intersection of two sets which is of course, again, a challenging situation. And that essentially the, the geometry of the constraints imposes essentially the challenges here also uh, in practice. So what can you do here? Um, well, what you can do is if you know, sorry for going back and forth, if you know that this affine constraint says only that this linear map or linear operator should live in some convex cone, K, then in principle, you can embody or incorporate these constraints, again, using barrier type of ideas. And here, the classical interior point literature becomes very, very important for our approach because we know from very classical work by Nesterov and Nemirovsky, that any kind of closed proper convex cone admits a certain type of barrier function, which is called a logarithmically homogeneous barrier. Okay, so these are again special classes of self concordant barriers with these type of properties. Okay, so the barrier function that we have here is always going to be smooth in a certain sense. It can take uh, derivatives up to order three over the interior of this cone. And this is the critical assumption here. There's a coupling between the third derivative and the second derivative in this specific way. And that essentially makes it extremely nice to work with these functions, okay? 
So this definition is a characteristic for self-concordant functions. And the last condition, that's essentially the added feature coming from this logarithmic homogeneity of the barrier. It says this scaling type of relation also holds true. So what are examples of functions you can think about that have these properties? So for instance, if you would like to minimize over the non-negative orthant, classical assumption, right? You have non-negativity constraints. This function here is a logarithmically homogeneous barrier where the nu is a parameter that comes from the geometry of the problem. And here in this example, the nu would be equal to n, the number of variables. Another example, as I said, right, semi-definite programming. If you would like to find a matrix that is positive semi-definite or positive definite, a barrier function that takes care of this would be the log that function. Okay. And for other geometries, you can come up with similar structures. So it always exists, but of course, only for specific geometries, usually geometries that have a kind of a symmetry in a very specific sense that I'm not going to explain here. We can talk about that later. For these functions, we actually can compute a barrier function in closed form and use it in an algorithmic design. And that's what is classically also used in interior point methods, uh, in particularly in primal dual type of methods. We are, however, interested in primal only type of methods. So what we could do is, well, we use this barrier function f, this logarithmic homogeneous barrier function to essentially enforce our solution to respect their fine constraints constructs a potential function. And that's the function we are iteratively solve over simpler domains, okay, where the intersection is now disappearing from our problem. There's only this set X, so it's a classical idea. There's nothing new here. And we would like to solve this now. Okay, so the method we are going to solve is targeted for, uh, the, the method we are going to propose is targeted for solving these type of problems. But of course, with the twist that again, X for our applications is usually of large dimensions. So again, just using a theory point methods is not going to be a solution for us. So we're interested in different methods. And on top, the challenge is now we created essentially a dynamic problem because now of course the T parameter that essentially regulates the importance we give to our barrier structure uh, this T should be somehow flexible, right? We should take this T to be large in order to solve our original problem. So we have a sequence of problems. And then the question becomes, what do we lose essentially? Can we do this in an online fashion with restarts, for instance, uh, at the reasonable accuracy, the reason complexity? And for both of these problems, so minimizing generalized self concordant functions for machine learning or minimizing functions with a barrier structure coming from conic optimization, these conditional gradient methods that we developed essentially guarantee the yeah, state of the art complexity guarantees with advantages in the subroutines. Okay, so that's a problem setup. These are the uh, uh, domains that uh, I'm interested in. Other questions about the problem formulations? So can you can you maybe give some insight into self concordance because I've never worked with it before. Yes, that will be the next slide. Okay. That will be the next slide. Okay, so let's start. So the first part, uh, this is already published work that came out this year in math programming, and it's about solving generalized self concordance uh, minimization problems. Okay, so for this problem, let me recap. We would like to minimize here a certain convex function, but the convex function we have here given is uh, patterned by some structure. So we have this generalized self-concordant property. And what is generalized self-concordant property actually meaning? Well, we can give this definition for a single valued function essentially on the real line, okay? So generalized self-concordant essentially means that your function phi, say, which will be then taken kind of a direction evaluation of your objective function, has a coupling between the third derivative and the second derivative. And this coupling depends on the scaling coefficient m and some power nu, where the nu usually is something that will be estimated from the data and varies between two and three. That's a typical thing. 
Okay, so nu equal to three is the classical situation. This is a classical uh, family of functions in that case that essentially has been the class of functions that Yuri Nesterov and Nemirovsky used in the development of interior point methods. And the generalization essentially comes from allowing this new parameter to be flexible. And that has been introduced in this paper by Kvok Trandin and one of his students, because essentially what I said in the introduction, we have seen as many interesting loss functions in statistics and machine learning actually have this type of relation. Okay. What are the examples that you can think about? So exa essentially examples are always going to be transformations of some functions. So let's go over the hierarchies that you could have in these problems. So for instance, in machine learning, in particular in classification problems, many times we're interested in loss functions coming from the logistic loss. Okay, so you have a binary classification problem, okay? And you would like to reconstruct essentially the probabilities of misclassification. That leads when you reformulate this into a kind of a log likelihood type of formulation to the logistic loss function. And it's given by this. Okay. <clears throat> For this function, you can show that this function f has or is a generalized self concordant function with either parameter two or three, you have some flexibility here. And actually this flexibility is going to be important as well as show you in the numerics. <laughs> so this is an example. Another example, a Huber version of a regression problem. So robust regression, where you solve a linear minimization problem, say after a convex transformation has been done, so a Huberized loss function where the phi transformation looks like this. Okay. This is another example uh, for uh, a generalized self-concordant function. Distance-weighted discrimination is a kind of exotic loss function that has been proposed as well in classification problems that come with this guarantee. And it's also a generalized self-concordant function. What you see, however, there's already on this slide a huge difference, a huge variability in the classes of loss functions that you might observe. For the logistic loss function, you see that when you take derivatives of this function, actually the gradient is going to be Lipschitz uh, continuous. So for the logistic loss function, standard gradient methods actually come with some guarantees. Uh, there's no problem. But the distance weighted discrimination loss function, because you have this minus q in the exponents, already comes with problems. Uh, here at the origin, the function is not uh, differentiable anymore in, in neither sense of Gato or whatever sense on the derivative you would like to impose. So here you have issues. So this is going to be a challenging problem for gradient methods where a vanilla gradient method might give you no guarantees at all and not even converge. Uh, so for these type of loss functions, some specific training methods are actually needed. Other examples, in information theory, okay, portfolio optimization does not refer here to some financial planning problem, but it could also be seen like that. Uh, this is a problem coming from coding and information theory um, where you would like to minimize uh, a, uh, uh, the log function over the unit simplex. This is another example for a generalized self concordant function where nu is actually equal to three. So this is a standard self concordant function. Covariance estimation problems, okay? So you, you would like to recover the covariance of some graphical model, say, okay? So you estimate the, the, the correlation between random variables and you embed this therefore into some random field and what you would like to estimate the correlation pattern. So the covariance matrix. That leads to a loss function of this type over a specific domain, even. And again, this is an example I gave it already to you for a generalized self concordant function. But also, in inverse problems like the Poisson inverse problem, this is also an example for a generalized self concordant function. Okay, so all these problems here are in some sense challenging for uh, standard gradient-based methods, essentially because all the gradients, when you have look at these problems, and also here for the inverse problem, all these gradients actually are not Lipschitz smooth. 
the gradients of all these loss functions uh, does not have a Lipschitz continuous uh, gradient. So without further modifications, a simple prox gradient evaluation will not uh, give you guarantees. Okay, so you need to worry about that. Okay, so these are a lot of examples. I don't focus so much on the mathematical properties of uh, generalized Stefan Kohn's because this would, uh, I mean, this would really uh, increase the length of my talk tremendously. This is a very interesting class of mathematical objects with some good connections to also geometry in principle. Um, so I hope with these examples, I could convince you that this is a relevant class of problems and it has some intrinsic features. So what are we doing? <clears throat> We are essentially trying to solve for all these type of loss functions. Okay, so all classes of generalized self concordant uh, loss functions parameterized by the scaling parameter M and the exponent nu, where we allow nu to vary between two and three. That has technical problems, essentially. Well, uh, so there are technical reasons why we allow the scaling between two and three. I would like to solve for all these problems. We would like to develop a family of algorithms that solves all these problems in an accurate way. Additionally, we assume that the problems we are looking at are well posed. So there is, exists a solution. And the set X, uh, which uh, represents the constraints, is convex and compact. Okay. Now, what is the basic tool we are using to design our algorithms. The basic tool we are using are projection-free methods. Projection-free methods have been at, well, I belong to the, the, the oldest algorithms we actually have for convex uh, optimization problems. They go back to Frank and Wolf uh, from the 60s, so even older than that, I think. And they have been forgotten for a very long time because usually the runtime they uh, exhibit is uh, or has been seen to be inferior to other methods, which is true, of course, because it's a simple first order method. So you can't expect more than sublinear guarantees uh, for, gener for generic problems. And that, of course, at the time when these methods have been developed, uh, sublinear guarantees have very quickly actually been categorized as too slow to be of practical importance because at this stage already the first steps towards the interior point revolution started and these methods are usually much faster. But uh, Frank Wolf a type of methods or the conditional gradient has uh, re uh, seen a lot of revival actually in a sense coupled with the machine learning uh, literature because essentially they, they give very cheap iterations. And uh, when you have a large scale optimization problem, the fact that you can run the method in a essentially cheap way, so it means a sub iteration or sub solver or solvers of uh, subroutines can be done very quickly. Uh, that seemed to be usually as a very, very attractive feature for numerical methods. And, and uh, interior point methods usually don't have this property. Usually in interior point methods, finding a search direction can be an extremely computationally challenging task. Okay, so here you have the opposite. Frank Wolf methods or the conditional gradient has very cheap iterations. Okay, so the per iteration costs are usually very low, but they might, might require a lot of iterations in order to actually converge to a solution with the desired accuracy. That's a trade-off we usually have. Okay, so how is this method uh, defined? The simplicity of the method essentially comes from the way how it designs search directions. Okay, so it's a simple first order method. It employs information from the gradient. It constructs a search direction. So that essentially means what is the target state in which I would like to direct my trajectory. And then I have to think how far I have to go. So I need to think about step sizes as well. Okay, but usually that's a cheap part. The hard part is only how to compute these search directions. Okay, and the search direction so uh, routine is really just solving a linear minimization problem. Okay, you take the gradient as your cost vector and you solve for a target vector S from your convex compact set X by solving, uh, by minimizing a linear objective function. 
So if X would be a polytop, you just solve an LP. So for something very simple. We measure the quality or the progress we are making with our methods by using a kind of a gap function that essentially says, how far away are we from the solution? And there we go. That's all we need. The standard conditional gradient or Frank Wolf method says, as long as my merit function, this gap is bigger than a tolerance epsilon that I decide, I query my linear minimization oracle to find a search direction. And then I employ some routine that tells me how I choose my step sizes. So that essentially means how far do I go towards my new target state SK. And I update my primal iterate accordingly. Okay. That's it. A very simple method. And the speed gains, of course, that you have with this method, I encoded really, I emphasize this in the search direction problem. So the implicit assumption you have here is that this linear program, in some sense, can be solved extremely easily. Okay, so this is what I said. That, that's essentially the attractiveness of this scheme. Now, what do we have? Well, Usually what you have here in this method is that you get same type of uh, guarantees. Well, at least as, from a structured perspective, you get similar type of guarantees as any other type of first order method for conditional gradient. So what you need usually in the, in the convergence proofs for uh, the conditional gradient is a Lipschitz continuous gradient. And on top, you usually would like to have some kind of finite curvature constants uh, on the function. So it essentially means you have some lower bounds on the spectrum of the Hessian of the function f in case it's a twice differentiable function. Okay. So in some sense, some strong convexity is something that is very, very much uh, useful when you uh, employ the conditional gradient method. But even there, in the generic case, what you have here is that the conditional gradient method is slightly slower than, uh, say, uh, the uh, Cauchy type of gradient method. And the reason for um, the, uh, well, this uh, slow type of convergence behavior can be illustrated with this picture here. So what conditional gradient uh, is usually doing is it, it constructs a trajectory that runs on piecewise linear segments. Okay. That's a typical type of trajectory you have. And it goes as follows. Well, at each, so suppose this is your current point, your current position. At this current position, what is happening is you identify a direction in which you would like to move. So this would be the next direction. Okay. Then your step size over time usually is something diminishing. So it's something between zero and one. So you don't go all the way towards that vertex, but rather you stop somewhere in the middle along this line, say here. Okay. And this is repeated. So in the next iteration, the x tape plus one, you identify the next vertex in which you would like to go. Your step size alpha says you don't go all the way until the vertex, you stop somewhere earlier. And there you go. This would be the next iterate. And what you see is then, because of this smaller and smaller step size, when you get closer and closer to the solution, there is a kind of zigzagging type of behavior exhibited by this algorithm. And that means in the last phases of the scheme, usually it gets very, very slow. Okay, and that's why the guarantees you get for the conditional gradient method are slightly inferior to a standard gradient method, like a Cauchy type of, of gradient scheme. Okay, so that's, that's the, the problem we're usually facing here. And on top, beside the zigzagging type of behavior, when you would like to apply it to kind of the uh, loss minimization problems I've shown you before, when you're not very careful in the design of the algorithm, you even get to infeasible methods. Okay, I cooked up an example. This is, of course, artificial, what I'm showing to you, but it illustrates, I think, very well what the problems are. Suppose you want to train or minimize this kind of function. Okay, so a logarithmic type of function. This is a log, uh, this is a self concordant function where the new is actually equal to three. Okay, and my domain is the unit cube. Okay, zero one squared. 
And okay, but for uh, maybe you have also these type of constraints. Okay, let's add these type of constraints. So you you want to minimize over the one-dimensional simplex. Now what happens? So if you start, say, from some point on the one-dimensional simplex like this here, say this is my starting point, and you apply a standard step size policy from the literature, which would read like this: two over k plus two, where k is the number of iterations. Okay. Then immediately, what would happen after the first iteration, you would go to this vertex one zero. Okay, so where x one is equal to one and x two is equal to zero. And of course, your function explodes at this point. It's not defined. Okay. So that shows in a, a admittedly quite artificial way that there is some, you need to be careful when you train functions that are uh, somehow barrier-like functions, like the self-concordant functions. And that's essentially what we do here in this paper. So in this paper, what we're doing here is uh, to construct methods that exploit the geometry of the problem encoded by the objective function and augment also step size policies to guarantee feasibility and recover essentially the best guarantees for these type of methods that are known. Now, how is the encoding of the geometry dictated by the objective function actually happening? So for this, we have to introduce a local norm, so a variable norm, depending on the current position of your state. So at a high level, if you want, I embed essentially my feasible set into a Riemannian geometry, where the Riemannian structure is essentially given by the norm induced by the Hessian of the objective function f. Okay. Why do we do that will become clear in the next slide. Okay, but this is key. So we embed essentially the problem in a local norm dictated by the geometry of the function f. Okay, that's of course only possible for any point in the, in the domain of f. And we adapt also a distance measure. Okay, it's so a kind of a metric, a metric structure that depends on the class of function we are actually having. We construct a distance function that looks like this. Okay, so kind of a metric that depends on the geometry or takes the geometry into account, properly speaking. So why is this local norm so important for us? Well, because the local norm gives us an automatic safeguard to avoid essentially going too far with our step sizes. Okay, so it gives us a quick guarantee that we stay always in the domain of the function f so that these pathological counterexamples that I just showed you are essentially avoided. And this happens by introducing balls or agreeing balls induced by this Riemannian metric, okay? So what we usually do is instead of the standard Euclidean balls, we're looking at the balls that come from the local geometry. So in terms of our distance function, <laughs> And in the general interior point literature, maybe you know that these are the well-known Dicken ellipsoid type of, of, of balls. Okay, so they have been used for many types of geometries. So what are these balls? So when r is equal to one, we get kind of a unit ball. And here I depicted the geometry for these balls for, for standard geometries. So suppose for a second order cone like this. So this is the example of a second order cone. I'm from where, is there a question? Oh, no. Okay. Sorry. I just heard some, some noise. Okay. Um, so you construct, you would like to construct a unit ball around a given point in the interior of a second order cone. Well, if you would do that using the geometry, the Euclidean ball would look like an ellipse like this. For an exponential cone, another geometry, very important in, in optimization. Uh, you do the same thing. A, a unit ball would look like this ellipsoid. And for the non-negative orthant, it would look like this, say, at this position. Now, what do you see? From all these geometries, a unit ball is somehow inside the domain, right? It's inside the set. It always stays inside the set. OK? So the, 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 the twist that we have given by our uh, adaptation to the local structure of the problem is that we get balls that always will stay within the domain of the function f. 
that's the cool thing. That's the magic that these uh, local norms actually do for you. Okay, so you can move freely within these balls and you know you will never fall outside of the domain of the function. Okay, that's why you need to adapt the geometry. Okay, and then that's what, what we're doing essentially. So I'm going to present you now a couple of algorithms. One is very simple and not very good. Actually, this is not what I would advise you to use in practice, but it's uh, the simplest one we have. So I should start with it from a pedagogical point of view. Uh, and then later on, we'll um, well, increase the complexity of the algorithm design to essentially obtain better algorithms. Okay, so let's start with a simple and not so attractive method. We call this the Frank Wolf generalized self concordant uh, method. And it's just Frank Wolf to so the conditional gradient I showed you before with the following twist. Uh, the twist is essentially embodied in the step size policy. So that looks like a function on a, an adaptive step size that uses the position of the problem and uh, the parameters that we have. Beside that, it's just Frank Wolf. Okay, so let's see, why can this make sense at all? Well, we have our target point that is constructed as before by solving a linear minimization problem over the feasible set. So this has not changed. We construct a, a set of curves that essentially are parameterized by T, by the step length, okay? So the T here determines how far do I go away from a current state? I can't go too far away, of course, so but the T should be always smaller than one because otherwise there is no guarantee that they stay overall in my feasible set X. But where do I have, how, how, how much do I have to truncate it? Well, well, I would like to stay within the domain. So this is a guarantee I would like to be seen satisfied. And over this restriction, I can use something that is a very, very powerful tool, which generalizes essentially the so-called decent lemma for Lipschitz continuous functions. Now, the decent lemma says essentially that if your function has a Lipschitz continuous gradient, you can say that uh, when you make a progress or you update your state from X to X plus, you have this type of inequality. Okay, so you get this type of majorization, but here the L in front of the Euclidean norm squared would correspond to the modulus of the Lipschitz uh, of, the, of the gradient. We don't have that here. So we have to think about something else. And the something else is embodied by this inequality. So you can prove for any type of generalized self-concordant function, we can come up with a modified decent lemma that reads essentially like the original decent lemma up to the first order, but the quadratic error term that you have here needs to be corrected by a function omega that I don't need to specify here. It's some function that you have in closed form, okay? That takes as an input the distance, measured in term of the hashian of the function f. And then you have a quadratic error term coming from the local norm. Okay. So that gives you control for, making, for measuring how much progress you're making in each single iteration of your method. Okay. So if you're interested in this, you can have a look in the paper. It's not a very difficult thing to prove this actually. All right, now what can you do? Let's see. Now we can use we can use the the ansatz that we have for our method, right? We have a first order method, so the field over which we are minimizing this here with respect to t is designed by this vector. So let's then use some uh, some some terminology, right? So let's call this is my this here is my gap function. So let's call this the gap of x because everything, the, the t uh, comes here linear, right? The t adds here linear, and this is a linear function. You can put it in front and we have here just t times the gap. So this is the merit function which, which we would like to drive to zero. 
And then we have a quadratic error term, right? So let's introduce some terminology. Let's call the delta essentially or, or T times M times delta represents essentially this term here. And I'm using, the, I'm doing this notational uh, changes now in order to isolate things that I can control over things I cannot control. The only thing I can control at this stage is actually the T, the step size. Okay, so I can rewrite my input here in the function omega in this way. Let me define the distance by this function E that is just a number and I have T squared here. So I obtain here a function that depends on T in a quadratic way. It's only here. So I can define a new function that depends on T essentially once my current position X is fixed. And I can ask myself now, well, how do I want to choose my step size, my T, so that I'm making sufficient progress by reducing the objective function value in the next iteration with the uh, restriction that I still stay feasible, which can be embodied by making essentially the T within this interval. That's it. That gives you a, an adaptive way to construct step sizes. Now the question you can ask for is, well, this looks very complicated. Are you actually able to compute this step size then? And the answer is surprisingly yes. It's a very simple optimization problem now, actually. So finding the step size boils down to a high school type of calculus problem where you just essentially compute the derivative of the function with respect to t, set it equal to zero, and solve. OK? So for any type of self-concordant function, depending on the parameter, we can come up with a closed form expression for the step size. Okay. And these step sizes, I repeat, do not only guarantee you feasibility along the trajectory, they hopefully also at the end of the day will give you some sufficient decrease and some good iteration complexity results. Okay. But that's it. That's the adaptive step size policy you can come up with. Oh, okay. Yes. What, yes. what is what is capital M? Because usually it's like a Lipschitz constant, but what yes, is yes, it's almost like a Lipschitz constant. So rem okay, capital M. Let me go back to the definition of a self-concordant function. M is part of the function class. So it's oh, okay, it comes with the problem. That. It comes yeah. with the problem. It's the scaling coefficient you have in front of this derivative. Okay, so I don't need to know that from my about my. Oh, I do need to know that about my objective. Uh, in this method that I just showed you, we assume we know it. Yeah. In the paper, we have adaptive versions that actually do a backtracking type of search on the M, so you don't need uh, to know it. Okay. I'm okay. not going to present these backtracking variants because they become a bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. So for time reasons, I thought it's easier to skip them. But in the paper, you have backtracking versions where you don't need to know M a priori. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Excellent question. You could do the same thing, by the way, on the new, but that's something we didn't try out in principle, yeah, yeah. okay? <laughs> Other questions? Well, we have about five minutes. A little bit longer. Than five, five minutes only left? Oh yeah. my God, I was slow. <laughs> I gave you 10 minutes. All right, okay, cool. Well, now let me just rush through the results. So for this simple method that, again, I would not advise you to use, but still it's an interesting method. Uh, we get, first of all, asymptotic convergence, as you would do. So essentially we have a decent method. So you get monotonically decreasing objective function values with an increment or decrement in this case that is in L1. So it goes to zero. So the energy of the process, so to speak, goes to zero. Uh, and you yeah, have some guarantees. But what is the complexity? So what is more interesting here the iteration complexity you have after some estimation of, uh, so you need some global bounds for this result. That again, that's why I don't think you want to use this method in practice because in practice you don't have these uh, uh, constants available, but we have versions in the paper that get rid of them. So just again, for simplicity, let me focus on the unrealistic uh, scenario that you know these quantities here. So you know uh, the level set essentially over the initial condition. And you know, say you have a kind of a local Lipschitz estimate on the level set. I don't believe anybody can compute that in practice, but let's assume you have it. 
Again, emphasis, we don't need it actually. In the, in the later, more refined versions, we got rid of this. Then you get an iteration complexity that still scales uh, like big O one over epsilon. So this says, this is the amount of iterations you need in order to get an epsilon optimal solution of your problem. And epsilon is something you tell me. This is the accuracy you would like to achieve. Okay, this is the accuracy you need for your problem. Okay. So this is a kind of a standard convergence guarantee for Frank Wolf type of methods. Okay, one of epsilon is something quite standard. The cool thing is in our analysis, when you do the fine analysis, you can even quantify the constants that essentially are involved in this big O one over epsilon type of estimate. So you can play with them. Okay, so they depend clearly on the parameters of the problem. So you can think now about uh, estimating these parameters for the problem that you would like to solve in order to make these constants um, smaller. Okay, that's an important thing usually in practice. Okay, now, as I said, for this simple first order method, this is the simplest one. I, as Thomas uh, was alluding, there are a lot of these parameters are maybe not known always. Uh, so there are backtracking type of versions in the paper. So you can have a look at them. They essentially allow you to get rid of this a priori uh, information and, and do some adaptive search over the parameters while you are optimizing. Okay. The guarantees, however, you get are more or less the same with, of course, changed constants. So this big O one of epsilon guarantees remains. Okay. Now, how can you speed up things? So because I need also to speed up, let me then be a bit uh, selective here. I'm going to show you a method that gives you linear convergence guarantees when you modify your algorithm by introducing on top of these conditional gradient steps, so-called away steps. So away steps essentially say uh, that you exploit the geometry. So for away steps to work, you need kind of a polytop type of domains where you can really enumerate essentially the extreme points of your feasible sets and exploit essentially the fundamental theorem of linear programming that essentially what you're doing in um, any type of enumerative procedure, you work along the extreme points or the vertices of your polyhedron. Okay, and away steps say, at some stages of your algorithm, you activate a vertex. At other stages of the algorithm, you eliminate a vertex. And with this way, you do some kind of search over the extreme points, over the polytop over which you're minimizing. And you have to do this in a clever way, of course, so to not perform exhaustive search, which is then not interesting anymore. OK. So away steps, uh, as I said, essentially have this type of feature. So they need two type of, of oracles. You need a class, the, the, the standard oracle that we had already, okay? So you try to find a vertex in this case now over your polytop domain. This would be a forward step in which you're going uh, in the direction of decrease of your objective function. And then on top, you need an away step, which is essentially eliminating vertices that you have identified that essentially perform bad. Okay, these are the ones you would like to eliminate from your support. And then you can do the same trick with a, a waste step method with our uh, tools. Again, you have to do some uh, clever tricks with the step size policies. So you have to do some adaptive search for the step sizes. And you have to have some mechanism that says essentially when you do a forward step, so you add a vertex to your, uh, to your support, or you eliminate one, so you do an away step, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, for time reasons, I cannot do the, explain this more in detail. But what is cool about this away step method, so even when we relax the standard assumption, so we still have a self-concordant function, we get suddenly linear convergence guarantees. With a coefficient theta that essentially drives the, the, the speed that can be explicitly encoded with essentially the same kind of coefficients that you had in our original methods that I've shown you. There are some additional things here involved. This omega, which is a kind of an error bound of Hoffman type that you can compute usually for polytops. And the diameter of the set also is involved here. Okay. But um, yeah, so that's, that allows you to speed up things. Okay. So let me then show you what, what it brings you. Okay. So in terms of numerical results. 
Um, we did a lot of experiments with these methods for self-concord minimization problems that have been used in, in practice in the literature. So first of all, let me maybe show you for the logistic regression problem, which essentially were, has been the main motivation for looking at self-concordant functions because there was a very influential paper by Francis Bach, who essentially discovered for the first time that you have this type of structure in these estimation problems, okay? Right, so as I said already at the beginning, for, self for the logistic regression problem, we have a choice. You can either think of them as self-concordant with parameter two or self-concordant with parameter three. Natural question would be that you might want to ask is, is there a difference <laughs> between the specifications? So what, how should I uh, think about my problem? Should I take two or three as the parameter? And actually there is a difference. It's a quite an interesting thing. So what you observe here, so this would be the relative error plot versus number of iterations when we take uh, the new equal to two. So here is the plot for new equal to two and here is the plot for new equal to three. So what you see here, new equal to two usually is much better. It gives you much better guarantees. So specifying the problem as a problem where nu is equal to two instead of nu equal to three makes a physical difference in the optimization algorithm. And that should be expected, right? Because different step sizes are involved here. You get different step size guarantees when nu equal to two or nu equal to three. So that's really the modeling choice that you have to make at the, at the beginning of your training. And it can lead to significant speedups. So here we compare what with- What is your algorithm? algorithm? Sorry? Which one is your algorithm? Yes. So all these, sorry. All these here are our methods. So this is the Frank Wolf vanilla version with new equal to three. Oh, sorry. Um, yes. So this is the Frank Wolf of new equal to three. Um, this would be for new equal to two. Then we have this backtrack. These are the backtracking versions that I did not introduce. So all these here are the backtracking versions. This is the away step method. And then we compare it to Proxima Newton. Okay. And Proxima Newton for these methods has been defined actually. And also has been defined in independence of the, this new parameter. Okay. So you see, of course, Proxima Newton is much better in general for these problems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what, is, what I would like to illustrate here is the dependence on the new, that it is really an important thing that you should actually be clear about when you start modeling things. Okay, now let me show you one more result where I think our results are yeah, quite interesting. So this is for the covariance estimation problem. It's another problem that I showed you at the beginning. And here we created kind of performance profiles performance profiles for uh, three different types of statistics. So we took a, a bunch of, of, of data sets. We have uh, initialized algorithms from different starting points. And then we averaged the results over all different starting points by constructing statistics, measuring the average iteration ratio. So that tells you how fast your method is, or how fast, how many iterations you need in order to achieve a certain relative error relative to the best performing one. That's this plot, okay? So because it's a ratio, you should see here, right? The, the lowest curve should give you the best algorithm, okay? So again, Prox Newton needs few iterations. That's to be expected. We know Newton method needs few iterations. Accord, uh, for first order methods, the prox gradient, this is this curve here, needs more iterations than one of our adaptive versions of the Frank Wolf method. So prox gradient solves a proximal problem as a subroutine, which is much more computationally expensive usually than as a linear minimization oracle. And it needs more iterations for achieving a given error. You can see the same type of behavior in time. So now we do the same type of statistical analysis, but with the CPU time, not with the iteration count. Okay, so again, when you look at this plot now, a lower curve, 
is better, so to speak, gives a better algorithm. And what you see here, Newton methods need a long time because they are computationally expensive to be expected. Frank Wolf methods, one of our Frank Wolf methods is very, very cheap. So here you have a clear indicator that this, this would be the waste step method, the one I showed you the, uh, the last slide in terms of the methodology. The waste step method is fast, not only in CPU time, but also in iterations compared to other first order methods. And here you see also in terms of the training performance. So here we constructed in this panel, we constructed another performance statistic that says in how many data sets that we used in our analysis, the method succeeded in driving the problem down to an approximate solution with this relative error. So one means 100%, all the data sets have been solved. And you see, uh, uh, actually, also the away step is the only first order methods uh, together with the Proxima gradient and Prox Newton that actually guarantees that, so that you always achieve this accuracy. So the, all these three uh, panels together, I would say, give strong evidence that this, this away step method uh, that we constructed is pretty uh, yeah, robust and, and, and performs quite well. Okay. That's it. I wanted to tell you about something else as well, but uh, I think uh, for time reasons, I think I should stop now. Yeah. There are more experiments in the paper. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, I kindly invite you to have a look at, uh, at the paper version. And um, yeah, beside that, thanks a lot for your attention and I'm looking forward for some questions. Oh, any questions besides my own? No. So you mentioned earlier, uh, this is just playing devil's advocate, that uh, linear programming is easy. So you said you have this linear complementarity. Not always, of course. That depends, yes. of course. So if I have a complex uh, linear program. Yes. Um, so, um, it's of not course. so easy. No. Nope. It's very large scale. No. Nope. Uh, so let me go back. So yeah. of course, the power of this method is really, as you say correctly, depending on the, on the efficiency of this step. All right, so the yeah. set X, the geometry is crucial here. Mm -hmm. And usually the geometry we have for these methods, uh, I mean, the, 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 all, the, all the methods uh, or, the, or the problems that we tried have a set X where this linear minimization oracle is really easy, where it boils down essentially to find the largest eigenvalue or something like that. Yeah, but would that be of interest to develop something for a more complex uh, large scale polyhedral set or that doesn't really appear so much? So, I mean, projected gradient is out of the question. Projected new probably as well. If I have a, like a, a very large, complex uh, polyhedral set, like the projection is going to be too too expensive. An interior point might also be very expensive. Right. So. Yes. So of course, uh, I mean that's something. I mean, if you have a very specialized solver for a certain domain where you're not even. I mean, we not necessarily have a closed form expression for this linear minimization oracle, but at least get good, a decent uh, numerical answer, then of course this method would be still very attractive. Um, however, of course, mostly in, in the machine learning context that we look at, the set X is, is well structured, so that finding as essentially the this, this search direction was is really easy. Yeah, got it. If you think about spectra, uh, so the domains I gave you here, like like such a domain like yeah, okay, you know what mm. I mean? then it's just really an eigenvalue computation. So mm. yeah. it's something you can do for free almost. Yeah, got it. The yeah. cool thing is, okay, that, that's, so the advantage is here really, if you would do the same minimization, but with the proximal method, then instead of an eigenvalue computation, you need a full SVD, um, which is much more much. Yeah, better. that's right. That's right. I've seen that problem. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, what about, um, for random objectives, so stochastic objectives. So I mean, here you're taking the full gradient, but what yep. if you do like a stochastic gradient or something? Like that? Excellent question. So of course, people in machine learning looked at that, obviously. Hmm. Not for these type of problems, I think. Um, so usually what we, when you couple this with stochastic models, <laughs> like variant production techniques, um, people have developed conditional gradient methods. Uh, but usually you assume there, of course, the convexity and Lipschitz gradient assumptions that you have from typical uh, convex optimization problems. 
So it's an open question for these type of problems. And it's not easy. Why is no. it not easy? Uh, because you have the domain restriction. You need to be careful uh, in your, the design of your stochastic algorithm that essentially you 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 um, stick you you construct a method so you construct iterates that stay feasible, mm -hmm. and that might become complicated when you do uh, uh, like SVRG or something like that uh, stochastic variance reduction techniques because usually right you then don't take the full sample as you say correctly but only a part of the sample. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, I mean, then you would do the step size computation also with your, with your batched data. How do you know that you're still in the domain of the full uh, objective function, right? So th that, that's the main question. Oh, uh, okay. Think, yeah, yeah I didn't even think about that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. But it's, an, uh, it's an all, uh, a very good question, obvious question, and something that should be investigated. I just don't know how to do it in a moment. Great. Other questions? Oh, online. Uh, Johannes, do you just want to say it instead of me reading it? Uh, yeah. read it? Can you okay. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, so I was wondering what a typical step size would be for the adaptive scheme you have presented. Uh, what do you mean typical? Uh, like, is it close to one or? Um, that's a good question. I would have to look at the numerics. It's some time ago that we did these experiments, but definitely it was something. Uh, it, it depends a lot. It, so let's go back maybe to the functional form. So first of all, um, as I said, so this method here, here is something that performs not very well in practice. I think I said this many times. So what we did in, 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 in the rest of the paper, we modified it by uh, replacing this with some, we, do, we did some uh, backtracking or line search, essentially a restricted line search using this as an upper bound. So there the, the scalability is about a bit more difficult uh, to, to answer. Um, but if I look at uh, just this expression here, right? Then it should actually become close to one, yes. Because this error term here, this E goes to zero when you're getting close to the solution and this gap function should uh, scale in the same at the same rate, right? So it, it would become equal to zero. Thank you. Uh, to one, sorry. Yeah. So the ratio would be close to one. But again, so we never we never in practice really used this uh, form. This was just a sanity check that the algorithm works, and in 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 the algorithm design and in the in the analysis as well, we use this then to to construct adaptive methods for line search type of algorithms. Using, however, of course, this is our safeguard. Okay, that was, uh, thank Matthias again. Thanks a lot. See you all next week.